coming right there. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm here with Sergeant Major Rick Lamb, who you guys know is just a total wealth of knowledge on all the military uniforms and equipment. And uh, we're going to go over the MACV SOG gear. But before we do, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor. All right, hey, guys, this week's video is brought to you by Advantin e-bikes. What's an e-bike? E-bike is where you can pedal it like a regular bike, or you can just hit the, hit the throttle and ride it like an electric motorcycle. Or here's the cool part. You can put it on assist and you can pedal it and the motor kicks in. So literally like you're going up and down hills, the motor kicks in, even driving cross country like I'm doing right now. Piece of cake. So it's, they're awesome. Eventon's got tons of options, uh, lots of big selection. They've sold over 200,000 bicycles. One year warranty, great customer service. The one I went with is called the Cinch. Right, literally, it folds in half. The handlebars fold down, even the pedals fold in. Totally badass, I can take it with me hunting, camping, but I can also toss it in the back seat or the trunk of that car for those emergency situations. So anyways, I wanna thank Advanton Bikes for sponsoring this video. Check them out. All right, hey guys, welcome back. We are, Sergeant Major, always a pleasure. Always Could a pleasure. Mac V SOG gear. We went over this a little bit before. If you guys are not familiar with Rick's series of videos he did with us, we did uniforms going all the way back to what, what was it, like 19... 1916, yeah. 1916, Next computer and then uh, World War II, Korean War era, all the way up to uh, your uniform and, and gear in Mogadishu. Uh, you guys have seen the movie Black Hawk Down. But the one part that uh, we got the most comments on and that everybody wanted to know more about was the Mac V SOG guys. Those were the, my heroes when I first got in the military. Same with me. I yeah. wanted to, I saw the John Wayne movie, I want to yeah. earn my Green Beret. Yeah. I got that, but once you're in, your heroes aren't John Wayne anymore. It's you, my heroes was the Mac V SOG guys. Way ahead of their time. I mean, way ahead amazing. of it. Amazing. Uh, amazing stuff. Yeah. I want you to share more with them, but I am so out of my league. So what I've brought for you, I'm going to hand the video over to you, and I have brought in John Stryker Myers Tilt. Come on out, brother. Clandestine infiltration. <laughs> How you doing, my brother? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm doing well. All right, so I am out of my element. Um, I'm going to go sit over behind the camera. Really? Please. No, because I want to learn. I want to learn with these guys out here. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go sit because I, I know when I need to, I need to get out. So, um, well, thank you. I uh, finally get to shake his hands all these years. Oh, I don't, and you're if, a if you leave me <laughs> hanging, that would suck. Okay. <laughs> I, um, gentlemen, uh, two of the finest Americans and definitely soft uh, legends uh, that you'll ever find on the planet. I've got them both on one video for you. It's going to be awesome. Right. Dang. Hey, and thanks oh. for this, Carl. The, uh, Thank the, the you very much. personal hero of mine. Likewise. And, and, and all this is, um, it's a labor of love. And so I'll, I'll collect things and then I'll ask like uh, Ken Bo Ray, hey, was it like this? And then I can bounce stuff off of you, was it like that? So, so we've got probably several years of SOG, because you were in SOG when? I was there uh, from um, May of 68 to April of 69 then returned in October 69 to April 70. Okay, and then, and Kenny, then Ken Kenny... came in uh, about a year later. Gotcha, yeah. So, and it was all the same team. Our team was uh, Idaho. Idaho, yeah. And so the, uh, I got on the team when the team was literally wiped out. Wow. In May of 68, there was an yeah. instant opening. Spider Parks became the one zero. Don Wolken was the assistant team leader, yeah. and then we geared up, ran missions. And, and you got a book out. Uh, three books. Three books, okay. That's okay. Yeah, Cross yeah. the fence on the <laughs> ground and yeah, the yeah. Saw Chronicles, oh, volume one. Yeah. Coming Amazing. back number two, we're working on it. Well, and again, like we're talking about before at breakfast, the, um, yeah, I've, I've, I only recently started studying this because so much of it was classified. I mean, we, we knew we had SOG legends, you know, in and amongst us. Um, yeah, you, we, we knew you, we knew Ken Bowray, we knew uh, uh, you know, some of the guys, Kenny McMullen. You know, some of those guys were actually sure. SOG men. But we didn't know exactly what they did because so much was classified. But what, what you knew that to hang on every word they said. And uh, so I, you know, when I was in Panama, uh, 89, and we started uh, working a lot in the jungle, uh, we went back to your SOPs. 
And okay. uh, we looked at a lot of the old SOPs, the B-52 chips. Them? And uh, they, they were, some guys had them. We, we had to go to Fort Bragg. And because uh, you could go to some of the instructors were still at Fort Bragg and they still oh, yeah. had some of their 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 memoirs or their their memos. And we had we had to figure out how to build a camps again. So we had to go to the weapons branch and get uh, get the guys there. Uh, you know, the, the blue light guys uh, were, were around. So so we just started collecting all these different uh, standard operating procedures and putting the uniforms. Because and the thing I liked about you guys was there was a place for everything, everything in its place. <laughs> and I mean, so so you were, uh, and it was a purpose for everything, and uh, and everything was either taped, tied, uh, padded, uh, and it was to get on the ground and run from the time you hit the ground until the time that uh, that you exfilled, and, uh, and be quiet. Yes, and and to be quiet. So I'd like to just cover some of the stuff. Sure. Uh, some of it may not have been uh, with you. Some of it may have been later with Bow Ray, but uh, but I again, I, I just say Ken, uh, Ken Bow Ray is one of our heroes because. Uh, one of his first assignments was in SOG running recon with RT Idaho. As a young lieutenant. Yeah. As a young lieutenant. Yep, yep. And then uh, Idaho was one of the first recon teams in SOG to run missions across the fence as an all in ditch team. Ken had him trained up that sharp, and then he went to Sidewinder. So he served on two separate teams and then went on to serve over about close to 40 years and retired as a two star general. Yep. Major and still, an still making things happen too. Oh yeah, he's uh, he's a good man. So I, I guess we'll start with the uniform. It was it was the standard, uh, you know, jungle fatigue. And uh, I know that uh, one of the things that I, I, I thought was was amazing that you guys had figured out that we just recently figured out again was uh, no reaction to medications and your blood type. So, uh, so you guys were some of the first that uh, you know, going into combat that would, would uh, like here O negative. If I come up on you as a casualty, I know your blood type, and I know you've got no reactions to penicillin or any of the other other right. medicines. And uh, we didn't have those. We did not. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, Bill Ray. He did. I, I got this from Kenny Bill Ray. No yeah, kidding. yeah. So, uh, okay, see, I'm learning so. something now. Well, thank you for that education. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, I looked at that because he's got a, he's got an actual original shirt. Uh, that I copied this one from. Okay. Um, so you know, it was the olive green. Uh, one of the things that uh, you know, the pace cord, sure. that, uh, tied down, compass in, in the pocket again, tied down, so that yeah. anything if you had to get out of your gear, then uh, then you had certain things on your body. You know, whether it be a backup pistol, um, the pockets on the sleeves. All right. So so again, one of the things that, that impressed me about you guys was the uh, you know, the fact that uh, that that you thought about. Where do I put the magazines? You know, do I slide them in a pocket in the shirt? Do I put them in, into the shirt? Um, and that's even like if you had time. And, and we'll get to some of the ammo that you carried here in a minute. Sure. But uh, now, well, uh, first things first. The shirt is most yeah. basic. So, in my day, our fatigues had this pocket, but there was also one that the manufacturer had. So it was correct. It had four pockets. Correct, and, and that's what uh, that's why I, t I removed these these pockets here, um, and, and sewed them but, on the sleeve. We added four. Okay, so you added. Okay, we had four gotcha. pockets, one, one on each sleeve. Yep. And then underneath here, we had a zipper up and down, black, and that you slip maps, oh. uh, morphine serrets, the signal mirror. Gotcha. And so that would all be in there. Beautiful. Those two pockets and whatever else. The, oh, um, we always carried a notebook. Gotcha. So you had yep. the notebook for notes from the field locations that you do photographs and stuff oh that's beautiful yeah so right. and so that would be different and, and, and yeah, your riggers is, your riggers did all this for you yeah oh no we would take it to a private tailor gotcha okay that would that would add the pockets and then because of the web gear hit us here like this part of the shirt um we never tucked it in but okay. the web gear would keep it tight so if you put the magazines down they would stay there until you unhook your web gear gotcha okay and then that's why we had these pockets inserted to have more stuff that we carry. Of course, pockets up here, yep. bandages and other standards, stuff we had to take to the field. Gotcha. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. Now, now, and again, the uh, the A7A strap, was that your standard belt? Um, ours was modified a little bit, and then I stopped wearing it. We went to uh, just wearing the cravat. They had the green cravats. Yes. Yep, yep. So we had one for here, always one around the neck, and I wore for headgear because it was quiet, no helmet, anything Correct. like that. And, and, and I had read that too, that, um, and that was one of the things that, uh, you know, when I went to third group, I took all those tips because I was coming out of Panama, and, yeah. uh, and, and we wrote that into the, the standard operating procedures for ODA 331. 
And everybody would say, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. So I, I took Sergeant Major Jefferson was the group Sergeant Major, and I took uh, all the written SOPs down, and uh, we went page by page and we looked at it. And uh, so we were the only guys who could wear cravats on our heads, uh, cravats around our neck, yeah. cravats as a belt, or a tourniquet. I had read somewhere where you guys had used the old tourniquets uh, for, a, for a belt as well, so that you would, uh, oh, I did. Okay. So that you would have it. And uh, some of this stuff I, uh, yeah, so I mean the, uh, and again, we've gone leagues beyond that with the medical gear now. But this right. was uh, this was the old uh, the old tourniquet. And they would either come in the nylon or the or the cotton. And the reason why we carried and, that, uh, Sergeant Major, was because people bleed a lot when they get shot, <laughs> which I mean, is one love, of the things. I love the way you say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things that you forget yeah. in peacetime is how much everybody bleeds. Because by the time I came, you know, into the army, it was uh, it was post Vietnam. You know, right. prior to the, you know, the, the the wars in the 80s uh, cranking up, so we would carry uh, one cravat and one first aid dressing on our LCE. And, sure. Uh, and they had forgotten the lesson that you know you're going to need more than that. Oh yeah, we always had one up here, also. Yes. Long number next to the hand grenade, the last uh, hand grenade. So so again, just the 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 thing I, I loved about your SOPs was a place for everything, everything in its place, everything had a purpose. Now your, your standard foot gear was just the uh, the standard uh, jungle boots. Jungle boots, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I looked far and wide. Not quite as polished as those. Yes, and you know the only reason I polished them uh, was to keep the leather from rotting. Oh yeah. Because the, uh, the these were um, these were brown you know, when I, when I first got them, but oh, I, but, right? I, but yeah. I put a I put a, pair, uh, a, a, a spot of polish on them just so that the leather wouldn't dry out, keep it kind of supple. But for you guys that uh, may not know, I mean, the, the first soles were the Vibram soles. Uh, then later they went to a Panama sole, probably in like uh, the late 60s. I heard 60s. about that, but I never saw yeah. one. If I saw it, I wouldn't recognize it. Yeah. <laughs> there was like a seam in the back here. And yeah. uh, so that's how you could tell the, uh, the original and Vietnam the era and the metal plate, yes. Because you needed it because uh, we had ex people that experienced uh, getting foot infections from punji sticks. Punji sticks, yeah. The A camps were they were going into an enemy camp and so they were set up uh, along the trails, uh, pits that guys could fall in or chip yes. in, and they also had yeah. uh, punji stakes along the way at different places. This is more in country. We never had that. Well, other than the Ashall, we didn't have that further west of gotcha. the layouts. Because yeah, yeah, because you're you're they weren't expecting you to be there. Correct. Yeah, we weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I forgot. Yeah. Now, now these were the uh, these were the Vietnamese boots, and uh, that uh, these were made in China. I, I read in a couple after action to where uh, you guys would occasionally wear these, or there was another uh, another boot that had actually a foot right. pattern on the bottom. So that, that came uh, from CISO, our uh, supply people. Yes. In Okinawa, indeed. So Ed Baker. If, if if you wanted Ed Baker, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So so if you actually wanted to get a. Uh, uh, leave like a footprint or leave um, uh, an indigenous print, then then you would sometimes. Uh... Yeah, we never we never got to this far to us wearing them, because uh, one thing about the, our jungle boots, we had that metal plate. So True. if we ever yep, or yep. think about stepping on something more explosive. True. You know yep. that would protect your foot a little bit at least. And we uh, had to be given the option. Well, we would have thought about it, but who knows. <laughs> Now, now th this is uh, this is a Ken Bore, um, special special here. He was, uh, and you can see some of the pictures of him. And he said uh, that these were nice <coughs> if uh, if you could find one that uh, wasn't blood soaked and didn't have a hole in it, <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't have a lot of time to uh, to do the battlefield recovery right, right. Uh, from the guy that you just shot. But it's um, it's the you know Vietnamese North, uh, North Vietnamese, Vietnamese Army official magazine holder. And Correct. Then, Whatever this was, and so it was—it's uh, a chess rig. You know, we'd, we'd, uh, today we'd call it a chess rig, and again, it just fits on. And so you can see pictures of uh, of Ken with his his stable rig, mm -hmm. but then he would also run a, an additional because you can get six but, and, thirty round magazines in here. And, we, and when you hold this up, we have to tell you a very quick story about one of our SOG legends, Eldon Bargewell, who was on a target in Laos, and he wanted to capture a POW, so Eldon chased this NVA soldier into a cave, and in the cave there was another hole where the NVA soldier ran in, Eldon chased him in, and when Eldon, before he'd gone into the tunnel, he wanted a silver near to take this home. Uh -huh. So he picked it up, put it on, 
and he was chasing this NVA. So he goes into the tunnel, into the cave, and when he jumped into the second cave, another soldier was there and shot Eldon in the chest. And the round hit this, knocked Eldon on his ass, and that night Eldon came back and, and was talking to Lynn Black and I, and he goes, God, I was lying there. I thought I was dead, but I said, wait a minute. If I'm thinking, therefore I'm alive. Yeah. But this saved Eldon Bardo's life, who was one of our, another one of our SOG yes. legends who served for 40 years, uh, many years with Delta Force. Yep, yep. And uh, this saved his life. And that night he came back with the Frenchman and they opened it up and the, the round was still in there. Wow. That, I, now it still had the Vietnamese hands. magazines in it too. Uh, yes. Yeah, those, those heavy AK. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. NBA uh, banana clips. Yes. Yeah, because because there you could you could uh, you can only get three, but uh, but you can get six of our thirty round magazines in here. Oh, is that and, right? Uh, oh yeah, and uh, so oh, see, again, I learned something. And, and then again, the uh, another thing that the, the pull the pull rings pull tabs. Ooh. So you guys had, uh, and again, this was to get them out fast. Um, you'd have uh, just your standard thirty round magazine uh, aluminum, and take a piece of uh, five fifty cord. That, uh, so that you'd have a have a thumb, a thumb loop see, or a finger loop. We weren't loop. that creative. For our twenty round mags, we just had electric tape. Okay. Yeah. And we taped on each side like you've done here, and then with a center. So when you came down, you could grab it and get it out. Gotcha. And, and then also, uh, I'd read were inner tubes. They'd uh, you'd take a little inner tube, rubber inner tube, or electrical tape, and really? put it around there to keep it from rattling, and uh, oh. keep it from. Uh, but, they were uh, using our pals so tight we never had a rattle. <laughs> well, that's true. Okay, we'll, we'll, no go into, we'll go into that in a minute. Yeah. Now, some of the other stuff that... Uh, uh, this is yeah, Ken's, right? Cut down, yes. Okay. Cut down VS-17 paddle. Oh, yeah. And uh, so, again, to keep you from carrying the, carrying the large one. Right. You know, the cut down VS-17 panel if you want to bring in, uh, bring in your helicopters. Yeah. And uh, several guys had it, so if you could, you could actually set up a drop zone if you needed to with, with, with several of these. Right. And, and then uh, we always have one of our guys that carried the big one. Yes. Just for good luck. Yep, yep. <laughs> yes. For that blind pilot. Indeed. <laughs> the uh, signal mirror. Again, one of the things that's uh, that's lost on the modern guys is that yeah. you know, with with beacons and everything else is I mean this this uh, this mirror will uh, will travel for a long distance. I mean you can uh, you know it's got the little peephole sight so you can you can actually see where you're. So I had a discussion of one of our Jocko podcasts about uh -huh. the signal mirror. So what's the what's the center for it? Because it's been 50 years since I used it. Uh, the center is is, uh, is a peephole sight. So you can sight so, it. So yeah, you can actually look through the center. Right. And uh, and so what I can do is I can see where the see where it's reflecting. Right. On my hand right there so i can look through here i can see the reflection and i can actually follow i can keep it on my hand and i can follow it all the way up and point at that aircraft as that aircraft right. is coming in so in and that way you know being, that the pilot's seeing you're, that. in our case we're in triple canopy or you just try to get try to get to a hole where you can see the sky and get sunlight on the mirror because one of the first challenges was you're on the ground you're in a firefight and covey comes out well how can i help you well, first I got to find you before yes. I get attack air to you, and then identify and you as a mirror. friendly. Yep. Yes, and the so signal that, mirror was one of our ways. We, they would do a flashy, then he would come in on that. Another uh, another thing here is uh, because you probably remember these, the old uh, plastic. Um, oh yeah. Th these were um, surrender leaflets, so that uh, the saw guys didn't use them. They're actually issued to the uh, to the, the army guys, but you could put a 20-round magazine in here, close it up, and then uh, it would keep it dry in the in the jungle environment. And then uh, in in uh, Vietnamese here, it's basically you know take this to the first American soldier and surrender, and we'll treat you nicely and we'll feed you. So it was a surrender leaflet. So as as the guys are using their magazines, they rip this top off, put the magazine in, they shoot, and then they leave these on the battlefield, and then. Uh, the enemy can find these and then and, and then that come was and after surrender. my time we never it, saw yes them. yeah this That's is probably really cool. it's probably yeah, yeah in fact this one's dated 70 so january February, march of 70. um but this was the old uh and you can see it's old <laughs> pen gun flare yes so absolutely. so once you get uh once you get to the through the triple canopy you get your signal mirror out you get the uh the aircraft coming in uh, if he's having a hard time finding it, you can pop these little pen gun flares, yeah. and uh, and then he'll he'll orient on that. So you just tell him a clock direction distance and the orient's on the pen gun flare, and then you can identify the mirror, uh, identify the panel, identify smoke. And, yeah, because uh, in getting sighted, sometimes it started with first, I can hear you, 
Yes. And then there we go. Turn left. I can see you now. Now do a 90 degree. And then once they're over us, say, okay, bingo, you're over me now. And that would be the start. Then we try to find a hole, get the mirror. Of course, you had the radio going. And uh, what? follow up with the pin flares. And then smoke. Yes. Directing tack air. And a lot of times that, that smoke was, uh, was he would identify the color. Right. You, you would toss the color, but you wouldn't say the color, but he would identify the color, and then, yes, that's how it's come in. Because, and again, just for our, our audience, you wouldn't identify the color because the enemy would monitor our frequencies. And start and popping had, the same color. Yeah. Correct. We had tragic results where um, they would say what the color would be, and the NVA would pop the same, and then there would be tragic results. Like in one case, we had a helicopter that went to the color, the NVA popped. It was NVA, not American. Oh, and we lost a helicopter, yeah. complete crew that was coming in to rescue the team. It's just crazy. It was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other pocket here, I think I had a compass in it. Uh, and again, all this design for oh, if wow. you were uh, the, and then of course, first day dressing. Why? Because men bleed a lot when they get shot. So, <laughs> yeah. so anywhere you can put a first day dressing, anywhere you can put a cravat, Anywhere that you could put, uh, and again, this is on the body, so in the event you had to get rid of, you know, if you're running fast and you got to peel off, then, then this will be the last thing that would be on you with, uh, with maybe a canteen in your, in and your again, pocket. And this is later cleaner. tactics. Yes, this, this was uh, probably Kenny Bora's yes, time. Because um, in 68 and 69, we began having our point man dress as an NVA. Uh -huh. So if we made visual contact with an enemy soldier, um, there might be a moment's hesitation Yes. So they would see the gear, think, oh, maybe this is one of our guys. Then I would give our point man a few seconds advantage to kill their point man, maintain yeah. the advantage. Hey, and also one of the things that uh, talking to uh, um, Ken Bore is the... Uh, and don't, oh, the, before I forget, sorry. 30 round magazines. We never saw 30 yes, round magazines. Yes, I remember you telling me that once too. And the uh, so the 30 round magazines, which is, is Ken was smart enough to was, get him. Was well, and another thing, the one of his pictures, he's got, uh, he's in the ERDL, the camouflage, right. you know, the Vietnam era camouflage, uh, which actually came out in '48. So it took us until '68 to put it into uh, put it into operation. But he would have to trade the Rangers for it. So he'd go down and he would trade the because the Rangers had the ERDLs. You guys didn't. And uh, he would trade the Rangers, and then of course put the put the pockets on. Yeah. Claymore bags. I read that you uh, did a lot with the Claymore bags. You know, here's here's the guy with the uh, with the actual no kid. There you go. Yeah. Full VS17 oh. panel. Right. But, uh, and then also uh, hand grenades. Oh, as, yes. as many hand grenades as you could carry. The uh, either the hand grenades in the uh, uh, in the canteen pouches. Or in a claymore pouch, or, or actually you, you, you physically carried claymores that on were on a, a, a time pencil, yeah? Sure. Yes, sir. And uh, I never personally carried a claymore bag um, because we had the hand grenades here and the pouch and then some in the, uh, our rucksack. Rucksack, yeah. And uh, That's my next build. i got to build one of those rucksacks. <laughs> yeah. I've got to, I've got to, I'd like to have the whole, and now, now you, you had, uh, did you have the baseball grenades, or did we you still have the, the, the 26s? M right? The M26 and okay. then the baseball, which were like, is that the 33? Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the 26 here. Yes, sir. So, uh, and again, the, the, the 26s, early Vietnam, and then uh, I think these are the 33s, right? The, right. Uh, the, 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 modern, the modern day. Yeah. By the middle of 68, we had both. Okay. Yes, sir. And, uh, and how many of these would you carry? As many as you could, yeah. Uh, ten to twelve. <laughs> ten to twelve. Yes, sir. <laughs> Which is incredible. The uh, the missions that you did now, you could not get a commander to sign off on today. Uh, we they, heard they, that they, before. They would, they yes, would not. They would not <laughs> assume the risk. No. And and now th this is this is probably the best um, set of gear that that I've ever seen. And uh, and actually, like I said, when I went to third group, this is what my ODA wore. And uh, so. Could you guys get a shot of this on the table? Or should we just the, hold uh, it up for them to get it? Like so? Well, cause I, yeah. So this is this actually is a, a stable back. rig. Yeah, right. this, is, this, is, this would be the back. And uh, you want to put it on? Sure. All right. There we go. Then we tighten it in the front. And then each of the... Uh, Can't see this. So I, I think I just had a... Uh, 
There you go. And this this was this was important. This belt because the uh, the newer belts you know, with the plastic snaps right. would uh, would flat come undone back in that day, and then you'd find yourself in free fall. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so it had had to be a metal clip. Right. The uh, again hand grenades. Um, these these leg straps. And these are, see we what? never used these. This was again a later the stable rig, and the reason why I had it. Watch your nuts. We, yeah, I got you it. Good. All right. Oh, brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why this was developed was so that when the team was getting extracted, all the uh, attachments were right on the web gear. Rope would come down, hook right in, and be lifted out. How are we doing here? We're doing well. All right. So on the so the stable rig itself right. was uh, again developed by the saw guys and. Uh, Again, they would carry without the straps, obviously. You wouldn't go through the jungle with the straps on. Right. They'd be but, rolled uh, up in the back. Yeah, when the helicopter would come in, you put the straps on, and now he's ready to go. Now, they, they would lower this rope. It's just a regular yeah. <laughs> a regular repelling rope that they would tie uh, probably an end-of-the-line bowling. Right. And, uh, have, a go, go, have a D-ring on it. Have a D-ring. It'd go into your snap link. And then uh, sometimes they have a sandbag yep. so we get through the jungle. Gotcha. They right. just backfeed it in the sandbag, throw it out. But this, this regular nylon rope, yeah, three quarter inch nylon with a one third stretch, is what they would drop from a hovering helicopter, hook into this rig, and then pull these guys out of the jungle. Which so is, that would be, and that would be the D ring would be on it, and then we'd have this hook here. That we well we had a D ring that would hook in. Gotcha. And so that's, but this is, um, and this is the Swiss seat. This rope here is six inch, six feet. And so on our day, what we had the, table, the Swiss like. seat would be taken off. Here you go, let me grab it. Hmm. He carried it up here, this is a different. This is the D-ring. So with, the, with this rope, we would l bring it loose, run it through our legs, uh, tie it on the side, and then right here would be a D-ring. And then when this rope came down with a D-ring, we'd hook into it. And so the rope would be either, could be 100 to 150 feet long. Yep. And so, because with triple canopy jungle, there would be over 100 feet up of jungle. So you had to get the rope down to the team on the ground. And then when you put the Swiss seat on in the middle of a firefight, it could be challenging. Yes. <laughs> well, and anybody that's done any uh, uh, army repelling, let's say at Ranger School, they still use the Swiss seat. And uh, you just tie, again, like, I said, the, the, like he said, the Swiss seat around, the, uh, around your waist, through your legs, tie it on together. The side on the side and then you hook it in and, and then you go right. and then you're holding you're on for dear, for dear life. Yeah? Right. Riding in this seat. And that's why they went to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because later, later versions, you could actually hook. There you go. You could actually hook this into here. And then this is what would hook on the right. And that would the hook helicopter. up to the D ring at the end of the rope. Yep. And, and then. the viewers may say, "Well, why be so secure?" Because a lot of times, well, not a lot. There are times when we had teams that were coming out on rope. The helicopter was lifting out of the jungle. Where they would be shot. Yeah. And they would literally get blown out of the the Swiss seat because the round would hit him, knock him upside down. If they weren't tied into the rope on a, with a chest D ring. They were gone, gotcha. so we lost several people that way. Oh, yeah, incredible! And uh, so this was an advancement that they had within SOG itself. Because when we yeah. first started, all we had was a Swiss seat and a rope with two D rings. Then they came out with the McGuire rig, which was a large leather loop, and you could sit on that, and there was a handle you could grip onto. Yes, yeah. And then hook into it with it, maybe with a D ring at time. And we had at least a couple of guys who, when they came out, were unconscious, and then they were just their hand was in 
in that the loop. little hook yep. in the McGuire rig. Yep. In fact, there's one guy, Dave Gordon, is going to be going in for shoulder surgery because he got pulled out, was unconscious, uh -huh. fell out of the seat, but he hung on. And uh, his shoulder was so bad that he's gone back now, 50 uh, years later, to get the surgery get it fixed. to repair his shoulder. <laughs> but he's alive. He'd yep, rather yep. be alive complaining about yep. pain than the alternative. This is true. Indeed. You know, and, and these rigs, we, we kept these <clears throat> rigs uh, with us well into the 80s, the 90s. I mean, now they use what they call a fast rope, which is a, it's a, but, it, but it's still got uh, woven into it yeah. the ability to, to hook into the bottom of that, uh, that rope and, and get pulled out. Sure. You know, like uh, f uh, fry spies or... Uh, or, or <laughs> So you got the hand grenade yep. handy, extra hand grenade. Okay. Now you got a problem with this. Now I got to talk to Ken. Because he roared this way. If you're in the jungle, you're going to pull your knife out, you're going to go up. Yeah. We always wore it with the handle down. Ah, okay. All right. This is, that way, when you had the handle down, right here, you pull it out. Gotcha. Where here, you have to go up into the jungle. Gotcha. Okay. Just a little point. We'll be fine. <laughs> I thought the cat. It's right. Well, Counsel statement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I got it wrong. I'm gonna have to go back and look at look at some of the pictures. Well, we got pictures there <laughs> plenty for you. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, if we Indeed. can put this back on the table, sure. uh, I want to go through the some of the magazines. Well, no, yeah, and, uh, also, or, or the, mean, the pouches the rather. Sheer weight of that. A little oh bit. my God! And, and this this does not have any ammo in it. No. So, if you're looking at um, and you know, one of the things that, that was just is just fascinating to me. Let's let's take this pouch here. Yeah. The, uh, it's got one 30 round magazine in the center that you pull out of the gooseneck. And then around that 30 rounder is five 20 rounders. And again, each one of them has got a pull tab where, that you can pull out. And so, what uh, is this holding device, Sergeant Major? That is a canteen pouch. There we go. <laughs> our audience should know it's a canteen so, pouch that was used yeah. for our magazines. Yes, and, and, um, and the way it, the way it uh, fits just like it was made for it. Yeah, that was I amazing. mean, the, with the 30 round there and the, in the, in the yoke. But uh, so you had, you had uh, what, five, 10, 15, 20, 20 round magazines. Right, and a lot of times, in the, particularly in 68, 69, we had uh, the BAR belts. Yes. Which was the World War II belts, which had a nicer shoulder harness on uh -huh. them. And so those were, they had magazine pouches where we could put four 20 rounds in and one on top. And one on top. And okay. close the lid. And then gotcha. each magazine would have the tape like you have here. Mm -hmm. This is the loop. We would have electric tape that came up each side so that in the middle of a firefight, you just empty the mag and just grip it and come and slam it in. Grab, yep, grab and go. go. So, so, each, uh, so each one of these canteen pouches would hold 130 rounds. Right. And uh, so, you know, figure, yeah, so was, was that 132, 60, 490, so 490, almost 500 rounds just that's in good, your... That's a good start. Just in your, well, uh, yeah, and, and, and then you add six more 30 <laughs> if, rounders. If they had that, I never and, uh, that. For and so, yes. so 700, I think 720 rounds was about the, the average. Later, at my and, time, uh, we just had 600 plus. Okay. Around six, it depends on how many max. So sometimes we have extra in our by the bottom of our rucksack. Gotcha. Because the case twice we ran out. Well, and that's why I asked Bowler. I said, isn't, "Isn't that excessive?" And he goes, "No." On one particularly bad day, on uh, Sidewinder, he said he was down to his last twenty-round magazine. Yeah. And uh, and I you know, even uh, when I was listening to some of your podcasts, I mean, you're you're actually shooting, hanging claymores in trees as they're dragging you out. Uh, Oh, yeah. yeah, on the way out of the jungle. Yeah, we on had, your last twenty round magazine. At least twice I remember we had gone through six hundred rounds, last mag, last hand grenade, and then the last round for M seventy nine. Wow. Sawed off M seventy nine. Do you have a copy of that here? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, the uh, uh, the old uh, Pacific um, first aid pouch from World War II. Uh, I, I think you had some some later model stuff, but uh, I'd read this one was popular if you get your hands on it, because a lot of this stuff and was I've in the been, inventory. This is the first time I've seen it. Okay. During my time, we never saw anything this sophisticated. They came out with a, a different pack, but we didn't tie it to the web gear. We'd be put in the rucksack. The rucksack. Itself. Okay. And. Uh, we never had any medics, so we were just trained up for the basics of wounds yep. and how to stop the bleeding, get on a helicopter, and get yep. back to the uh, closest hospital. And, and the uh, we, we talked about this earlier was yes. um, this this uh, they called it the cricket, and uh, so this was a uh, this was a mask, and it, it, it folds up, 
And you see a lot of the pictures, the guys would wear it on their web gear. Right. And uh, so it fits in the web gear, and it was just for CS. Correct. So that if you, because uh, you guys had used CS to break contact, to, uh, to right. you know, to, to put some distance in between you and the, and the enemy. And, uh, and this, this was a mask that was, it was small, it was lightweight, and, uh, and you could wear it in the jungle. And again, it was, uh, this, this particular one was only, only good for, uh, for CS. And that's a different version of what we carried. Our, our uh, mask was bigger, bulkier, and I think it could handle different gases besides CS. Okay. And the pouch was much bigger, so we couldn't carry it on the web gear. We always had to strap it to our side gotcha. underneath the web gear so that some of the uh, pouches would be uh, on it or alongside okay. it. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, th I think you're right. I think this one came probably post-1970. And... Uh, and it, these these are hard to find now because they like. Well, and again, for for the purposes of our audience here, the Secret War went on from 1964 to 1972. It was an eight-year Secret War across the fence. We ran missions into Laos, Cambodia, North Vietnam. What we didn't know at the time was it had the highest casualty rate in the war. Yes. And um, over 100 percent. Over 100 percent. And then you go, well, how did that happen? Well, some people like Bob Howard who received the Medal of Honor. Uh, December of 68. Yeah. Was put in for it three times. Put in for it three <laughs> times, got one, and uh, um, with that, he had been put in for 11 Purple Hearts, but he actually received only eight. And there are others that had uh, several Purple Hearts. So that's how, between being killed in action, missing in action, or wounded more than once, that's how you exceed 100% casualty rate. And again, thanks for doing this. This is like a boyhood dream, because you, know, you, you build the stuff from from different after action reports, but then you you never have the ability to for somebody to actually confirm it. Yeah, it was well, on and, the ground with it. And and like and, I said uh, earlier, the eight years. See, this is an evolution, because we are always finding ways to do things better. So by the time Ken gets there, at the end of seventy one and seventy two, uh, this is his advance. Where there's things on here that we didn't have. Wow. Yeah, and then it just um, kept getting better. Yeah, and then he has his conventional web gear, whereas if we could get him, we get the BAR belt. Gotcha. And because uh, the shoulder harness, yeah, every little bit of comfort, any little element of comfort we could get, we took it. True. You know, and actually uh, later, I think I've got a BAR uh, belt for uh, 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 the next video, and uh, but they were wearing the medic, um, the shoulder straps. Oh, yeah, for, right? for the medical aid bags, because yes. that provided just that just that different uh, additional amount of comfort. Yeah, I, I'd like to cover the weapon if we could uh, grab that thing. It's uh, oh, I think it's yeah. got the bolt to the rear, and uh, but this is what you carried, yeah. This is it. This is a different ours version. What I think was the 177 X2. Okay, yeah, the E2. Yeah, yeah, E2, yeah. Yep. I'm sorry, and was, the barrel would be a little bit longer, but the same flash suppressor on the end, mm -hmm. or whatever the official name. I always called mm -hmm. it a flash suppressor. What could you use when the, M, the M16 came out, right? And, right. Uh, and then you guys wanted something shorter. So I think they, uh, they initially put a 10 inch barrel on it, which this one's got a 10 inch, but then it, was, uh, it wasn't as accurate as it needed to be, so they went with a 12 inch barrel. So that was your E2 or your E3, right. the, uh, or, or E2 rather, because you had this longer flash suppressor on it. What that allowed you to do too was, uh, was put a grenade launcher on the bottom. And, Some uh, guys did that, yeah. but again, in the jungle, it would get caught up a lot. Gotcha. Well, well see, Lynn that Black always carried it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lynn, yeah. yeah. And he liked the firepower because uh, when the, we ran out of here, you had one round for your M79, yeah. the 148. And uh, so, in my case, I just didn't like it because it was just cumbersome. And we had the sawed off M79, which we can gotcha. talk about later on. But yeah, this is our original baby without yep. the scope. Okay. Yeah, that, now the Colt, the Colt Commando sight. scope, I think, came out. It was like a four or five power. And uh, some guys carried them, some didn't, but you didn't like it because it snagged, yeah? It snagged, well, I, I didn't carry it because it snagged, and in the jungle, 99% of the times, we never could see more than 10, 15 True. feet. And it would fog up and probably right. uh, get condensation and everything on it, too. So, so we never even worried wow. about it. In okay. camp, profile shots, yeah. it was cool. It was very cool. <laughs> All right, well, I'm taking it off. Right, yeah. And then, it, of course, we had the 20-round magazines. And again, the CAR-15, the beautiful thing about it was this little part right here, the magazine release. Yeah. Because in every firefight, you can release the magazine, get the new mag out, slam it in, and on this side, you just click it in, it pops forward. Well, the AK they didn't have that quick magazine release. Yes. Yeah. And the safety and was not the safety right was not good. either. Yeah. So these were perfectly designed. Of course, I extended, 
but we usually just carried it in most of the mm -hmm. time. And I remember a few times that we ever pulled the stock out to actually put it to my shoulder to aim at a target. Uh -huh. It was rare. It was rare. Now slings, the, the, the guys, it was whatever you were comfortable with, right? I, I took this one off of an old aid bag because I saw it on the, uh, saw it on one of the, the, the pictures. Uh, again, the, the, you would tape first aid dressings to, to just about Some guys would, everywhere yes. you could to, uh, well, so this it was is easy to find. this is a full belt. The trouble with it is it's noisy. Yeah. So we never used this in, with, our, with our cars. Okay. Initially, I had uh, just a piece of rope like this and tied it down, taped the ends so it was quiet. Gotcha. And they had the right length so it would be just right about here. Gotcha. And okay. then... Um, and, and it was just tied onto your web gear? No. No? No, loose. It would be just tied here and here and then I had the round uh, my neck. So gotcha, like gotcha, this. gotcha. Okay. I, I think that's all I've got, other than uh, this rucksack here. The uh, I found this online. I'm going I'm to try to uh, either use some paint or some dye and, and get it uh, similar to what you guys use. And right. then I may I may use you to to tell me what went in what pockets, what actually went into this, because it was they were uh, they were somewhat local local made. Yeah, with the uh, a lot of again a lot of our equipment came from CISO, which was okay. the supply unit for SOG. And that Special was in Forces. Japan. They were in Okinawa. Okinawa, okay. With uh, Ben Baker, okay, right? Who yeah. was the he was the top guy, and he would go out with special forces to the A camps, see what they needed. In our case, he would come up to our bases and talk to team leaders and things like that. And over time, they, because initially the first boots we had weren't jungle boots, but he was, uh, uh, did that. And then uh, for even for the rations, they needed rations for our indigenous personnel. So True. They developed rice yeah. rations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they did it with flavoring and seasonings for the indigenous, which would be fish and shrimp, things that they were used to, and then a meat dish. And they would get a little plastic bag, put in the seasoning, put in their uh, the add water, and they tighten it, put an extra body, get body heat to warm it up, and then they would eat it later. Now, now I, I had read and they somewhere. Also, by the way, yep. Ben also added vitamins, so there'd be nutrients added to this. Uh, oh, that's which, way before its time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, now, yes. we, we do that now with you know bodybuilders. This is done but, in '63, uh, '64. Now, I also I had read somewhere where you guys uh, had you would you would go on to um, the the indigenous rations as well because the uh, I mean you know, my my wife's Korean gal. You know, I'd spent a lot of time in Korea. Yeah. And uh, and and when you're eating a lot of the the rice and the, especially the kimchi and the um, the garlic. I mean, you, know, you could smell it in the sweat. Oh yeah. And uh, so that, uh, and I, I'd heard that, um, yeah, you you'd use unscented soaps, um, those you know, prior to a mission, so that you wouldn't smell like a gringo out in the woods. Is that is that true? <laughs> Some guys were that dedicated to the mission, and they were smart about it. They were smarter than me. So there were times I did take a shower because we knew we weren't going to shower. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I would just use whatever would, back then. I be life soap boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But the, the, that's true, because when you're in the jungle, the, your, your sense of smell is heightened, and the enemy could smell our body odors. Yeah, if just, we're just as we could smell theirs, yeah. And, and cigarettes, tuna fish, you know, those kinds of things, they, they carry across the, oh, yeah. across the jungle. Yeah. We just didn't smoke. We just told them, no smoke, don't even take them. Gotcha. And the only time you could No dog flies. tags, nothing to identify you as an American. Right, we, yeah. had to go in, uh, we had to go in clean. Uh, no dog tags, no photographs, no letters from mom, nothing. And for the map, it would just be a, a six by six cutout of the map where our target area was. Yes. For no further yeah. indicators on gotcha. it. Gotcha. And uh, even any notebooks we had would be like a new notebook with minimal information in it. So it would be no intel they could gain. Because the reason we had a secret war, our government agreed to have no combat troops in Laos and Cambodia. The North Vietnamese, the communists, the honorable bastards they are, agreed to the same thing, and uh, but never did it. So by the time I land in uh, Vietnam in 68, May of 68, there are 25,000 troops in Laos, anywhere from 25 to 100,000 in Cambodia. And this was after Tet. And they would come across the fence, attack our bases, yeah. then go back to, quote, neutral countries. And... Um, that's why we had to carry all the extra gear because uh, we were out there by ourselves yeah. and waiting for the Air Force or um, Marine Corps or Navy Air to come to support us. And Army, of course, yeah. gunships. 
Incredible. And we had a South Vietnamese Air Force that for our troop carriers. I had heard were, the King Bees, yeah. King Bees, yeah. absolutely uh, uh, fearless, amazing aviators. We could talk more about that another day. Yes, we got to. Yeah. I'll talk you off. Carl, another. yeah, we need, we need another we need another segment. There we go. <laughs> so that, that's that's all I've got for but you today. On this, but on thank the you. Backpack itself, we would have one extra canteen, and if there was no water, then a second canteen. Got you. Then we have more magazines back here, and then in my case, I always carried the, the Prick Twenty Five. Okay. And a battery, so the battery would be on the bottom, the Prick Twenty Five, and then I'd wrap the battery. I mean, the uh, radio with in the back would be my sweater, huh. the OD sweater. It's yeah, the only yeah. thing that we wore for, and a small rain jacket. And the rain jacket would have a little hood that would come down to here. So if you're sitting, when it rained, the rain would come right up, right down your ass. So you have a clean <laughs> ass from sitting in the rain. <laughs> and then um, Very important. Right, indeed. <laughs> and then a few other things aside, maybe a couple of rations. And we had LERPs, which yeah. were dehydrated rations. Gotcha, yeah. And then again, we just throw the water in, wrap them up, put them inside for body heat. And when it's time to eat, we take a break. Yeah. And even like a six-man team, it would be two eating at a time. Everybody else is just ready on standby for security purposes. And of course, extra bandages, extra grenades, anything else that would fit, that would be part of our package. Gotcha. Okay. Well, this, this is my next, uh, next thing I'll work on. And the pockets on the... Yeah, no, before yeah. we go, I wanted to say thank you for today, for all your hard work here. No, 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 thank you. Absolutely, yeah. a little something for you, sir. Outstanding, thank you, sir. Absolutely. I already got one of those. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> You're the tactical rifleman. <laughs> all right, Rick, I want to thank you for bringing all this stuff out here. Easy. I want to thank you for That's all the great stuff you've done for our country. Really? Uh, John, uh, always honor. a pleasure. Uh, guys, you need to check out his book, Across the Fence. Uh, he's it got is, two. He's got three total. He's got a yeah. couple, but uh, the one I really like yes, is Yes, I'm saying with you. You can promote your others. I'll promote Across <laughs> the Fence for you. That's right. We appreciate uh, it. But we've got to keep encouraging uh, Rick. Rick needs to write a book. He really does. He does. Uh, he's already in a couple of history books, but you need to write a book. It's going to be a comedy like it mine. It will be a comedy. Be yeah. a comedy. <laughs> My book will be a comedy if I ever write it. <sighs> I, um, uh, truly a pleasure. I hope you guys got as much out of this video as I did just sitting over there on the couch. I'm like, wow, I remember doing uh, so much of this stuff as a young recon private, uh, thinking we were cool, thinking, wow, man, this is this was the best idea the you best ever had. Ever. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> knowing that I stole it from my squad leader, <laughs> having no idea that he had done all he had gotten all this. From I forgot the last yes, thing. The watch. The yes. watch. We have SOG issued. Seiko watches, and this and this now we're talking 1968. So this is a 1967 Seiko, which at the time was self wind, and it's luminescent. And it had the date and the day, the first time I saw a watch, and they, they were issued to us. And I was fortunate enough to get the, my original ones in the Atlantic Ocean somewhere, but this is one <laughs> a friend of mine gave me, and a collector. And uh, so this is ours, yeah. which we had. And of course, we always wore gloves. And what kind night, of gloves? Uh, Flight gloves, cloth, cloth, contact okay. gloves. Gotcha. Cloth on top and little leather underneath your fingers. Gotcha. And then. Uh, Did you cut the fingers out or leave them just in? Just the tip, tip for the thumb, index, and middle finger. Gotcha. And the middle finger just enough so you could grab the electric to pull out your gotcha. uh, on, okay. the, on the magazines. And the left hand just kept the full glove. Gotcha. Okay. Because in the jungle, you just get torn up. Oh, yeah. yeah Clothes. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, what's, what's that called? That uh, black palm. Mm. Yeah. And uh, there seemed to be thousands of different thorns that would be just tearing up your clothing. <laughs> yeah. But this was so bright at night, I always had to keep the watch under the glove. Yeah. So uh, right at night, at midnight, we knew when midnight was. You have combo for a combo check usually yeah. around midnight or whenever it was. Predetermined. Which, which back in that day, I mean, you had uh, you had predetermined contact times, right. and uh, you didn't have the headquarters sitting on you. What are you doing now? What are you doing now? What are you doing now? Right? It wasn't pushed to talk comms. Yeah, back then yeah. it was just basic comms. We yeah. Worked off the uh, uh, FM frequencies with a prick twenty five, and at night there would be a combo check, and it would be, they had an airborne command center that was always up over Southeast Asia, and. Uh, then if we made contact during the day, sometimes they would be nearby, then we'd get air access to us quicker. Sometimes you'd be in contact three or four hours before you got air. Yeah. You're right, we need a, another segment of this. Yes. Or three. Oh, exactly, <laughs> yeah, just incredible. Guys, um, 
That's all for today. You guys know the deal. If you've got questions <laughs> for these two fine gentlemen, I know, and that's cool. If you guys want to see me bring these guys back some more, you want to learn about the combo, you want to learn about some of the other stuff, understand we'll share uh, tips, techniques. I, we don't share tactics on the internet. We don't uh, because the laws of physics haven't changed. And likewise, a lot of the great stuff that these guys did, uh, our troops are still doing it again today. So well, leave the and, comments and, below. I'll pass it on. And remember my line. We... We set the standard, you guys improved it and moved forward. And that's what the SF is all about. Special Forces at its best. Without a doubt. All right, you guys know the deal. Airborne. Comments below. Y'all take care and shoot straight. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything.